Good afternoon. Is that okay? I want to tell you about two epiphanies I had just about a decade ago when I had been designing for 30 years and teaching design for about 15. It was the end of the 1990s, and I was running the San Francisco office of Meta Design. Uh, and we had, we served mostly Fortune 1000 clients, uh, and I spent a lot of time on airplanes in multiple time zones working on large, complicated projects that were very rewarding. Our work won awards, our clients paid us well, mostly on time. All of our offices were growing, and we'd never even made a cold call. Sounds perfect, right? But at the height of the internet boom, when I was making more money than I ever had before, and our company was being assigned ridiculously high valuations within the context of acquisition conversations, I've never been as disillusioned with design and felt as rudderless as I did then. It seemed like overnight, converse conversations in our industry shifted from design to profit, from quality to quantity, and to business models predicated upon unbridled growth and acquisition. It was crazy. It was during this period of very deep questioning that we took on what appeared to be a dream project from an international client with a hip, edgy project um, and brand image. They asked us to design a mega system, interior retail spaces, uh, signage, the works. It was great. They understood and valued design. They were going to pay us well. They had great photography to work with, and they pretty much gave us carte blanche. The designers in the studio were ecstatic, you can imagine. And we did some really great work for them. So great, in fact, that they came back and asked us to help reposition them in the marketplace by refreshing their identity. Amazing, fantastic. The design gods were smiling on us. Or so we thought. Because partway into the project, we learned that the reason they needed to reposition themselves was because bad press was about to break regarding their questionable practices in foreign factories. So there we were, halfway through a highly lucrative, much sought after by our competitors, potentially award-winning project, confronted by its irrefutable connection to exploitative practices a half a world away. Suddenly, our perfect little project was riddled with deep and far-reaching ethical implications. So what to do? Resign the project? We couldn't. We needed the money to keep the doors of the company open, to keep the lights on, to keep the computers cutting edge, to buy top-notch pension and medical plans for the company, and to buy all the other things that kept our, our firm a good, interesting, and I thought ethical place to work. So remember those two epiphanies I was telling you about? The first one was this. In solving for a simple problem that we could see, we were actually exacerbating a larger, complex problem that we couldn't see. And our seeming success had landed us with absolutely no wiggle room when confronted by an ethical problem such as this. So before I continue, <laughs> Let me say a word about epiphanies. They are flashes of insight that seem to come out of nowhere. Um, let me back up. In solving a problem that we couldn't see, that prompted me to start looking for these unseen connections everywhere. And once I did, I couldn't stop. It's a little bit like having a pebble in your shoe. At first, it's an irritation, then later it becomes a blister, and eventually it prevents you from moving forward. I became convinced that either I had to learn to design in a more appropriate and responsible way, or I was going to have to do something else that was more connected to solving instead of exacerbating large problems. And so suffice to say, in, the, in September of 2001, just about a week after 9-11, I left my company with absolutely no idea of what I was going to do with the rest of my life. The abyss. 
The irony was that for the first time in my life, I actually had time to think deeply about design. And some of the questions I was pondering at the time were, given the large and complex problems confronting the world, what can I do that makes a difference on any scale? What role should design and designers play in the 21st century? Do we have as much to contribute to meaningful solutions as, say, architects, scientists, or politicians? Or have designers become so completely bound up in consumer culture that we actually have fewer alternatives available to us? Is there an underlying universal problem at the root of most short-lived or failed design solutions? Is the real issue our perception of problems and the way in which we frame them in too narrow and short-sighted contexts? And more importantly, can I in good conscience continue to teach my students to care about fractions of millimeters between letters given what's going on in the world? Is it the design equivalent of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? <laughs> yeah. So, I was seriously considering a career change in October of 2001 when I walked into my office and I pulled this book off the shelf, and it literally changed the course of my life. That afternoon, I opened it to the chapter on systems thinking, which is based upon the study of, of living systems. Now, I've always considered myself to be a systems designer, and as such, I fancied that I thought a little further out than most looked at problems a little more holistically, and tried to design frameworks that would be adaptable to change. So on that particular afternoon, I thought, ah, I am undoubtedly going to see parallels between the living systems that Fritjof Capra is talking about and the way that I approach design problems. But I didn't. I only saw a contrast. And that was my second epiphany. I realized that I was actually designing in opposition to the principles that Capra had been talking about, not in harmony with them. Now, I grant you that may sound a bit abstract, but epiphanies are, after all, highly personal things. So suffice to say that it stopped me dead in my tracks and made me realize that I would probably be a student of these systems for the rest of my life. Capra argues that it's a crisis in perception that keeps us from seeing and solving for the large social problems confronting us today. It's the result of an outdated worldview that's incapable of seeing the interconnections and interdependencies between small local actions and large systemic problems. I became so convinced that these ideas had the potential to transform design process that I wrote Fritjof Capra a letter. And he answered, and he invited me to breakfast. <laughs> and he suggested that I study with him for three weeks that summer at a center for ecological studies in the south of England called Schumacher College. And I did. I got myself across the ocean, and I studied with Fritjof for three weeks. And when I got to Schumacher College, I discovered that they offered a master's degree that was based upon the study of, what do you think, living systems. So my favorite Yogi Berra quote is, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. So I did. I applied to the program. I got accepted. I sold everything I own. I moved to Devon, England. And for an entire year, I immersed myself in the study of living systems, or as I've come to think of it, how the world works. My master's thesis attempted to connect living systems principles to design process. And when I finished, they invited me to stay on and teach design in that program. I did. So for four years, I lived simply in community on a tiny, tiny fraction of my former six-figure salary, and I'd never been happier. That's not moving. That experience changed utterly the way that I think about and teach design. And so in the time remaining to me, I want to talk, I want to give you just a little, little taste of some of the things I've been studying for the past 10 years about living systems and how they relate to design. So living systems theory tells us that the world is comprised of systems nested within systems nested within systems. 
and that the relationship between the components of these nested holes is where the meaning and power lies. Remember that famous film, Powers of Ten, by Ray and Charles Eames? Well, that essentially illustrates the universal nested structure that underlies life from the subatomic to the galactic levels. It really is the web of life. Living systems theory tells us that life's natural tendency is to organize into ever greater levels of complexity, into network structures and patterns that emerge out of seeming chaos without external imposition or direction. So in other words, organization wants to happen. So imagine that, designers. The world isn't waiting for us to bring order to it. Now, I don't know how many of you were laboring under that delusion of grandeur that I was, but I realize I was for quite a long time. Living systems theory tells us that open systems, and what we mean by open systems are ecosystems, organisms like you and me, groups of organisms like Art Center or Pasadena, operate in a state far from equilibrium. And counterintuitively, they display their greatest potential for creativity and innovation the farther from equilibrium that they get. So think about that for a moment. The creativity is in the chaos, and order will almost always spontaneously emerge out of seeming disorder. So the implications for design, I think, are large. If chaos plays an essential role in the emergence of order, then as designers, we can catalyze and leverage that natural flow and understand that every single thing we design is embedded in a larger complex system whose structure and behavior we can never entirely see, understand, or certainly predict. It would be hubris to think otherwise. There is no waste in nature. Everything nature designs, from beaver dams to spider webs, from coral reefs to ant hills, is biodegradable. Did you know that ants comprise the same relative biomass on the planet as humans, and they've been here far longer? But the last time I looked, they weren't struggling with pollution and overpopulation and depletion of their natural resources. They've actually mastered the art of living sustainably in place. And Janine Benyus, the author of an excellent book called Biomimicry, lists nine essential design principles found in nature. Nature runs on sunlight. It uses only the energy it needs. It fits form to function, recycles everything, rewards cooperation, banks on diversity, demands local expertise, curbs excesses from within, and taps the power of limits. Now, consider these characteristics in contrast to most of our society's infrastructure, say the economy, the consumer marketplace, or our transportation and energy systems. They're usually predicated upon models of unbridled growth and short-term results. So if we wanted to find comparable examples of that in nature, cancer or weevils in a flower bin spring to mind, and we know how that ends up. So design in nature is based upon clear, finite limits and long horizons of time. So consider that principle in contrast to the approach a multinational corporation would use for global expansion or to launch a new line of products. And consider these nine principles and ask, do designers consider them in even the smallest decisions that we make every day? I know that they weren't central to either my design process or my worldview. Living systems theory tells us that everything is changing all the time. Cells, individuals, systems, environments, rules, priorities, even change changes. But how many times as a designer have you thought like this? Have you thought, if I can just find the right solution and manage to get it implemented, Everything will be all right, and it will work like clockwork. Well, that, my friends, is a mechanistic concept that we impose upon an organic world. For years, I, I uh, did studies in Basel, Switzerland, 
where they invented the grid. And I can tell you that this Cartesian view is deeply embedded in my cellular tissue. I also worked for years at large corporate identity firms and would watch in frustration as carefully designed and documented identity systems were put out into the, to the world only to begin to fragment and erode the minute that they got out there. I now question if it's feasible to design these large global centrally administered systems that have to be locally um, implemented and used. A characteristic of healthy ecosystems is their diversity and their unique local conditions and limits. Perhaps design solutions should be the same. And Margaret Wheatley is an organizational change expert who works with organizations to help redesign them from the inside. And she uses living systems principles to do this. And she says, we must give up believing that we design the world into existence and instead take up roles in support of its flourishing. We work with what is available and encourage forms to come forth. We foster tinkering and discovery. We help create connections. We nourish with information. We stay clear about what we want to accomplish. We remember that people self-organize and then we trust them to do so. And Einstein famously said that problems cannot be solved within the same mindset that created them. If he's right, then one of our most fundamental and simple tasks may be to try and learn to see and think differently. So some of the things to try. Remember that the most critical step in the design process is the way in which we frame problems. And remember that any frame we draw around a problem is an artificial one. And whatever we design will have ripples of consequence that extend out into the techno and biosphere in ways that we can never predict or understand. Try to better understand how the world works. Remember that miscalculation and mistakes will always be made. That ignorance, just like hubris, is part of the human condition. Try to think in longer horizons of time and particularly in what we make. Remain a student for life and stay in conversations with students because they're more likely to think outside the box and after all, the solutions to the really big problems are gonna fall to them to create. And finally and most importantly, look outside of the discipline of design for learning and inspiration because you never know where that epiphany is gonna come from. Thank you.